Hey there, I'm Rachel Aaring, and you're listening to the Top Music Piano Podcast. Get inspired as we discuss creative resources, trends in piano pedagogy, ways to grow your income and streamline your studio, and new ways to engage your students each week. If you are a teacher who wants to go beyond the method books to create an innovative studio that fosters lifelong music makers, you've come to the right place. Hello, piano teachers. I hope you're doing well. I have a really great episode for you today. Do you ever have anxiety over the rates in your studio? I think we have all been there. We worry about being too expensive or we worry that we aren't charging enough, but don't know how to go about raising our rates. We think that we are going to drive people away if we charge what we are worth. Today, my guest is helping us face all of those anxieties head on. We're talking today about setting rates for your studio, and my guest, Andrea Miller, has some amazing insights for you. Andrea Miller is the piano teacher and entrepreneur behind the Music Studio Startup Podcast and Blog. She talks about all things business and coaches musicians who want to build financially sustainable studios. She started teaching piano in high school and decided she wanted to open a music school. After she graduated from college with a double major in entrepreneurship and piano performance, that goal to open a music school became a reality, and she launched a school that quickly expanded to five teachers, an intern, and 100 plus students. Eventually, that experience led to other entrepreneurial endeavors and consulting opportunities in all sorts of fields. She loves working with entrepreneurs and small businesses. And in 2016, she decided it was time to bring her expertise back to the music world. So she launched Music Studio Startup. Here's my chat with Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy that you're here with us today. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business? Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, So yeah, I'm Andrea Miller. I'm a piano teacher based in St. Louis, and I uh, have a private studio right now, but I've had every every form of studio, private studio, virtual students. I had a multi-teacher studio, so I've kind of done a little of everything and enjoyed all those things. Just I like the I like the exploration, I guess. (laughs) Um, And then I'm also the host of the Music Studio Startup Podcast, and I coach music teachers to help build financially sustainable studios. Yes. And your podcast, I think, is where I first became familiar with you. And then um, we're going to talk about some of the other ways that we've worked together later on. Uh, But before we get into our topic for today, can you tell us a little bit of how you got into the business side of music teaching and helping music teachers with the business part of it? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I came kind of backwards, I guess, to teaching. I've always been interested in entrepreneurship and I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur even before I knew I wanted to be a piano teacher or a piano player. So since I was like three or four years old, I was telling my parents that I wanted to start a business someday. And then as I grew up, I got into piano lessons and then I realized, oh, piano could be a thing that I teach. And actually someone asked me to teach and that's how I got started teaching. So it was all very demand led, I guess, you know, people were asking. And then I I decided to start the music studio and um, ran the multi-teacher studio for a number of years and then had to move and leave that studio behind. And so when I moved, I started working with, I decided I'll, I'll go more the business route because I had studied entrepreneurship and piano performance, wanting to do both. And when we moved, I thought I'm going to go more on the business side and just kind of, I have a broad um, skill set because of running my own business. So I'm going to see what I can do for other startups or entrepreneurs. So did that for a few years and then realized that all of the things I was helping these other um, business owners with music teachers were asking those same questions and needing the same kind of support. And of course, I still have that passion for music. So I I, I shifted and started Music Studio Startup as a blog and then later a podcast. Um, And just, yeah, kind of helping teachers with all the different things, you know, the the marketing, the branding, the um, website building, the, (laughs) the finances, the accounting. And over time, With that, I've learned that I especially like the finance side of things and just breaking it down, um, helping teachers understand finances from uh, from a business perspective, like a legitimate, if you needed to go into the bank and ask for a loan, you could speak the language that your banker was speaking and understand them and like hold your own in that conversation. So I always take like the real, real business terms and 
try to just break it down and empower teachers to adopt that as you know a space that they belong into. Yeah. And you're really good at it. I didn't realize that you had started with business owners who weren't necessarily music teachers. That's interesting. Yeah. And it was just, you know, like I, I was networking and kind of stumbled into these opportunities and it happened to be a lot of STEM education companies. So there was some overlap, but my parents are also engineers. And so with the STEM, like it was fun to work with a lot of engineers uh, on their businesses that tended to be the people I, you know, aligned with. But yeah, and then and then I, I love the music teacher world and I, I want to see that world thrive. And I think there's so much opportunity um, in music teaching as a career. And there's you've heard it all. Everyone's heard it all. There's a lot of um, presupposition that it's not a sustainable career. And so I really want to shift that <laughs> that narrative. Yeah, I think that your podcast has really started to change that narrative. When did you start your podcast? I'm just curious. Oh, um, it was 2018, mid 2018. Yeah, I think I probably started listening a couple years after that, but I, I still love listening to your podcast. But today we are going to be discussing lesson rates, which is always a hot topic among piano teachers. Where should teachers start when they're trying to decide how much to charge for their lessons? Yeah, great question. <laughs> uh, for me, it all comes back to sustainability. So I start with a personal budget. Make your budget, figure out what your, I often have teachers do a couple of budgets. One is like the the bare minimum. This is what I need to just survive and maybe give up if I, if I have a job that I'm trying to shift away from, or maybe I'm doing part-time work. Like, what do I need to make for my teaching to be able to quit that other thing and dive full-time into teaching? And then I also encourage teachers to make the the bigger budget, like the the aspirational budget. Like I would like to be able to take a vacation and you know save for retirement and all those things. And you might not start there, but that's just kind of a a reality of starting starting a business of any kind. Is you might have a lean period as you build up to the bigger thing, but ultimately it needs to be able to support you and your financial goals, whatever that looks like. And so a budget's a good way to set that baseline. Yeah, I love that because I think so many teachers go from the other way. Like, what are people going to pay? What are the going rates? They don't even consider what do I need to actually make this sustainable and earn a living? So I really like that you start from that place and then you can go and do the research and all of that. So is there a formula that teachers can use to figure out what they need to charge in order to be profitable? So for a solo teacher, just a rough, rough formula to use here would be to take your studio expenses, whatever you expect you need to spend to maintain your studio. That's piano tunings or purchasing instruments, rent if you've got it, all of those studio expenses, studio management systems, credit card fees, then add your minimum salary, take home salary that you want, and then add taxes to that. And that gives you your minimum business revenue. So studio expenses, minimum salary, taxes. That'd be the minimum. Do the same thing with that maximum budget or the aspirational budget. Studio expenses plus aspirational budget plus taxes. And that gives you your aspirational revenue. And then you can divide up that by the number of students that you want to teach or the number of... Yeah, I, I like the student number versus the number of hours. You know, if if a comfortable teaching load for you is 35 students a week, then that's what you'd want to base that number on. And then you just have to make sure to actually charge that amount and not start giving discounts and things like that, because that'll cut into your your minimum budget. And that's where I see teachers fall, in, fall into trouble where they they actually do charge. You know, they they've done some math and figured it out, but then they say, oh, well, this this family has three kids. And so I give them a discount and and it's very easy for um, the discounts to like kind of creep in and, and make a big impact in your personal budget. Great. I love that formula that you gave. And then if teachers want to take the number they came up with and do some market research to see if they're in line with maybe the going rate in the area, what should they look for as they're doing that research? Yeah, I always have mixed feelings on looking at com competitors, if you want to call them competitors, colleagues, <laughs> rates, because I know there are so many studios out there that are not sustainable and they're charging rates that like the teacher who's in that studio is stressed out because they're not making, you know, able to pay their bills or so I find it a really unhelpful benchmark a lot of the time. 
Um, so I tell people, observe the other rates as you would observe the clothes that other people are wearing. And, you know, like that's their sense of fashion or whatever. It's just it's it's a data point, but it's not the only one. More helpful than looking at like a, a private teacher's studio, sometimes looking at the big box studios, I think is more helpful because they've got their business models figured out. So I'm talking about like the franchise ones. They've got their business models figured out. It's a different product that they're offering than a private teacher, but that might be a more helpful number. And then also think about where, how you want to position yourself in the market because they're just numbers, you know, just like it's, it's a blue t-shirt instead of a red t-shirt or, or it's a Target t-shirt versus an Armani t-shirt. I don't know if there are Armani t-shirts, but you know, you might say, okay, that's great. They're, they're teaching in this way or offering this product. And what I'm offering is different. And so it, you know, it warrants a higher rate or, or whatever. So it's a data point. It's not the only one and it shouldn't prescribe what you charge. Sure. That's a really good point. And you can find a huge range too. I mean, I'm in Southern California, so I can find a really huge range of what people are charging and it doesn't always give the full picture. You know, you don't know what else they have that's contributing or things like that. So you have to kind of do your research, but maybe take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. The thing I think it tells you is when a parent goes to shop for lessons, if they're shopping rates, it kind of tells you what they're going to expect is normal. And um, it doesn't mean that that's what your your rates have to be, quote unquote, normal. Um, but it, it tells you what your parents are likely the expectation that they'll come in with. And then you know how to present yourself when you're having that conversation on the phone, um, you know, whether you're higher than that quote unquote, normal number. Okay, so I'm curious about this. We've all heard about the teachers who are undercharging and you mentioned them. Have you ever heard of a teacher who's overcharging and just can't get students because their rates are too high? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing more to say on that. <laughs> I kind of figured, I feel like piano teachers are so, they have such big hearts that, we just tend to not charge what we're worth most often. I'd be curious if someone has tested that. You know, an interesting experiment that I ran for myself when I was starting a studio. You know, I've moved around a bit, so I've started studios from scratch. And at one point, I, I decided I only wanted eight students. And so when I got to that eight student mark, I thought, okay, you know, I kept getting calls. So I just raised what I quoted people by $5 every time someone called. And then I just kept going up until, you know, I, it was just like, I just kept quoting higher until I, I got any feedback and I, I didn't get any, <laughs> any people turning me down for that. So um, that's an experiment you can run, especially if you have a full studio, even if you don't like just, I don't know, just, just try things. Yeah. Good advice. And if you do reach that, pricing yourself out of the market, talk to me because I want to interview you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about raising rates. Can you tell us some of the mindset shifts that teachers need to have about raising their rates? I think sometimes the you're worth it kind of rah-rah language is actually unhelpful <laughs> to us because teachers are like, sure, I'm worth it, but I still want to be nice or whatever. And um, one way I like to think about it is that you as a worker have value in the market and you could be doing, you could be a school teacher, you could be a librarian, you could be a construction worker, you could do an, any number of things you could do with your time and as a worker in the marketplace of workers. And I think sometimes as teachers, we start from this place of zero plus, like we have no income and then we add some income to that. And if instead we think my time has a value in the market, if I were a teacher, I'd be making $60,000, like a school teacher or something. I'd be making $60,000 and thinking like, that's my target. I should not be making any less than that. However I make it is up for debate, but I shouldn't be making any less than that just in general because of my value as a worker in the market. And thinking of it as like, this is the minimum. This, you know, expecting a, a reasonable salary from it rather than, oh, anything is just above zero. So that's great. 
I think that's probably the biggest one. And I actually find that teachers who are shifting from like, maybe they were a school music teacher and they're shifting into private teaching or other careers and they're coming to music, they come with that mentality of like, I expect to earn a, a living wage for the work I'm doing because I did it before. And so I expect it for myself now. Um, they actually come with a really healthy perspective that I think serves them in building their studios. Yeah. And I think also, as we think about teaching, we can't base it on a 40 hour work week. If you're teaching 40 hours of 30 minute piano lessons, that's 80 students. You're going to be dead after week yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of other factors that you have to take into consideration with all of that. I found my sweet spot was 35 students, like any more than that. And I just, I, I wasn't serving them as well as I wanted to. So I never based any projections on teaching any more than 35, 35 students, not 35 hours. So that was like 17 and a half hours or, you know, plus or minus, but that was a sustainable energy level for me and how I could deliver the, the service I wanted through my lessons. Yes. And teachers shouldn't feel bad about setting rates based on that versus 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. So I have had people complain about my rates and it doesn't feel great when that happens. How should we respond if someone says that we're charging too much? I completely understand and respect your family's budget. Thank you for inquiring. And then yeah. they <laughs> it really can, doesn't, doesn't yeah. have to be any more than that. Yeah. It's not our job to make people feel good <laughs> or, or, you know, to make it work, work for everyone. And I think we'll get into that a little bit more later too, but it's okay. It's okay. Not for everyone. That's fine. What if our current students are their family, our current families are complaining about the rates or if we do maybe a rate raise and they make a little stink? Mm hmm Yeah. So this can get into really nuanced areas. When I, I coach teachers privately on this, and they'll, they'll, there might be a scenario like uh, the parent was out of work for three months last year. So they're just like, their budget is tighter. And I think there's room to be creative as a teacher in, in your offering there. I think when you have a budget for your studio and for yourself, it gives you the confidence that you're not trying to take advantage of people. You're just doing what you need to do to be a responsible business owner. And also as a, you know, you've got a, a conservatory that you manage. So you've got teachers that you're paying out of that too. And I think just resting on that confidence that you're, what you're doing is being responsible for your, your business and the people who work for you and all those things. And, and even if the only person who works for you is yourself, but that's not, that's not an insignificant thing. You know, that that's enough. That is enough of a reason to to hold your rates. And yeah, someone might not like it. If extenuating circumstances, you know, you might have, you might say, oh, we have this scholarship fund or, you know, have some other accommodations for those sorts of things. But I I think uh, it, it can be short-sighted to just cave and say, oh, okay, we'll keep you at the old rate just because we like you and we're afraid to lose you. Yeah, it, it doesn't serve anyone long term. It doesn't even serve the students because teachers then start to resent the students because they're like, oh, they stopped practicing and they're not paying me the same rate as everyone else. Again, this is just for the typical, typical student if they their parents are complaining and, and yeah, cave to their <laughs> um, yeah preferences. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk, since you brought it up, about some of those creative ideas because I mentioned earlier Piano teachers have big hearts. And what would you say to the teacher who wants to make sure that they are still affordable to the family with multiple kids or the family that's struggling financially or the, you know, family who's lost a job or something? Mm -hmm. Yes. So first, I want to separate the idea of lesson affordability from business sustainability, because they're not mutually exclusive. You can have both of those things. And I think we lump them together and assume that if a business is sustainable or even just reasonably profitable, then we're somehow like being mean and um, exclusive or something like that. And it does not have to be that way. Um, business is super creative. Like there's so much room for creative uh, business structures and lesson formats. And we don't, 
we're seeing more of it in in the music industry, but it's just such a, a creative um, outlet, really. And so one of the rules that I, I set for my clients is um, you can kind of do whatever you want as long as it doesn't impact your you can, you know, be flexible to whatever degree you want, as long as it doesn't impact your finances or your schedule beyond what you want it to, you know, set your boundaries, financial and, and personal um, time boundaries. And then, and you've got flexibility within there. Just some examples of things that teachers have done to make their, make sure their lessons remain affordable. You can do alternating private lessons one week and group lessons the second week. And so you might have like a private lesson weeks one and three of the month, and then group lessons with eight other kids on weeks two and two and four. And so that reduces the amount of one-on-one time because let's face it, one-on-one time is just really, it's got to be expensive. And so you can reduce the cost, the monthly cost to the student, making it more accessible, but still making it sustainable for you. And that's a great solution too for teachers. Some are reluctant to just go exclusively group, but usually they can find a way that kind of gets their one-on-one time that they really want with a student and also gets the um, takes advantage of the the power of multiple students in in an hour like in a group lesson there so there's tons of stuff to do there additionally sometimes we we set our rates to accommodate the the lowest common denominator you know like oh i want to be able to serve this student who who can't afford my regular rates and so i'm going to set my rate for everyone at this this low level but the fact is there are plenty of students who can probably afford 20 percent more 100 percent more than your regular rate and are happy to pay it so you can also use some kind of you know charge more more than you quote unquote, need to for the majority of your students and then build up a scholarship fund for the students that need some kind of subsidized lesson. Or you can also raise outside funding for that. The real key thing is, again, just making sure it the numbers still work in the end, that you're not giving so many concessions that then you can't pay your rent. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good, a really good suggestion. Not You don't have to set it at the the minimum, right? You can set it a little more and then you'll have a little extra room to to work with. But I do love the different models of lessons and not everything has to be one-on-one. Even if that's your preference is to do one-on-one, you can still really take advantage of group lessons as a way of just reducing the cost of providing the service to your students and, and students get a great experience still. There's no, no lacking. And I think there's enough evidence that group lessons provide different things, you know, not, not worse things, different, um, skills are developed and, um, different, yeah, different things come out of those. Yes, absolutely. So let's say that a teacher has decided to raise their rates. How do you recommend they go about communicating that to their families? Great question. Yeah. And just really undramatically, (laughs) I recommend two, two kind of prongs to this. One is to put a line in your policy that just says every December or January or September rates will increase. Um, you could say by this amount, or you can say, you know, like 5%, or you could say some, some range. Some teachers use the cost of living adjustment as, as a guide for that. Um, so that line goes in your policy, just put it in there today. And then two months before send out the email that says, and tuition for the 24, 25 school year will be this. And that's it. You don't have to apologize for it. You don't have to justify it. Your business, everyone's seen the the higher prices at the grocery store and on Netflix and everywhere in their lives. That's just a regular thing for rates to to raise. So you don't don't need to do any more than that. And yeah, it's not very emotional. It doesn't have to be emotional. That's a good point. You don't have to make a huge deal out of it, right? And if families want to have conversations about it, then you deal with those as they come. Yes, yes. And that's a great point, too. I had teachers who will put in a line like um, if this, uh, especially if they're in a substantial rate increase, like if um, this is a concern for your family's budget, please reach out to me um, and we can we can talk about it. Oh, one other thing that I forgot to mention earlier, sometimes with the families with multiple kids, like let's say they've got three kids and I've had teachers use this strategy when they're changing, raising rates substantially. And sometimes they'll do 
I've got three kids. They used to be coming for an hour and a half. Now I have an hour slotted for that family. So the impact to their budget isn't, it doesn't change with my new rate. That family has an hour slotted and they can either do 20 minute lessons for each kid or some alternation thing where they've got student A and B on week one and then student B and C on week two and student C and A on week three. So they're keeping the the rate that the family is paying monthly the same, not impacting their budget, but it's making it so it still works with the teacher's budget and financial sustainability. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So I want to make sure that we talk about some of the things that you are offering in your business right now, because they're really exciting. One of them is um, you're opening the doors to your Business 101 course this summer. And I have to tell listeners, I took this course several years ago. I Maybe the first time you I offered so. it. I think I so. Think You're when, OG. Mm-hmm. I think so. <laughs> when I was first getting started in piano teaching and kind of being doing more self-employed things, and it was fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about the course and what listeners could expect if they enroll in it? Yeah. Thank you so much for asking and, and for your uh, recommendation too. So Business Building 101 is what I describe as like a foundational course to opening a music studio. And anyone who's opened a studio (laughs) knows that there are a lot of decisions that you have to make. Like, what am I doing about a website? Uh, What should I charge? What should I call myself? What should I like all those questions? And so Business Building 101 is designed to like guide you through each of those questions. And I I've tried not to make it very prescriptive. Instead, just saying, here's here's the topic. Let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about setting rates and and lesson models. And here are what some different options, things that teachers do. And then you choose which one you want. And I I give guidelines for how to make sure it's sustainable. So take your vision and then view everything in the course through your vision and select what works for this type of studio you want to build. Um, and then we'll check it to make sure it's sustainable all along the way with all those decisions. So that's kind of what it is. It goes through all those, all those basic um, decisions we talk about identifying an ideal student, setting a personal budget, um, making your financial model for your studio, designing lesson packages, studio policies, enforcing policies. Um, And then I also get into self-employment taxes and saving for retirement and those things that um, we don't always hear very much of. Yeah, so many important topics in this course. And then along with that, you also have the grant competition coming up. Can you talk about that? Yes. So I think this is airing in early July. So it'll be just before the deadline um, in mid-July. But the grant competition we started in 2020 as a way to help teachers um, who are just starting out. So it's for new or new-ish teachers, I say. Someone who's started their their studio within the last three years. Um, And there are a number of prizes, which I can't announce yet. Um, So there's a $1,000 cash grant, as well as subscriptions to um, different services that teachers need when they're getting their studio set up. So studio management software, things like that. But those details are great. So where can listeners find out more about these things and possibly get in touch with you and work with you more? Yes. Um, so musicstudiostartup.com is the website and the podcast Music Studio Startup, anywhere you listen to podcasts and on Instagram at Music Studio Startup. Well, Andrea, this has been so valuable. Thank you for taking time to talk to us and share with us all your expertise about setting rates. I know that our listeners are going to find so much value in today's episode. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Rachel. I love how matter of fact Andrea is about setting lesson rates. I think as teachers, we tend to let our emotions or what we think the rate should be get in the way of the facts. Andrea gave us a great framework where we look at our financial goals and how many students we want to teach and set our rates accordingly. If you have questions about the financial side of your business, I encourage you to reach out to Andrea. She is one of those people who geeks out over spreadsheets and numbers, and she will help you get things in order. That's the end of the show for this week, but we are going to be doing a number of episodes coming up on the business side of piano teaching. So I hope you will keep tuning in each week because there's going to be some great information coming up in the next few episodes. I'm Rachel Aaring, and you've been listening to the Top Music Piano Podcast. I'll speak with you soon. 
how do you keep up to date with all the latest trends and research into music education? How do you connect with other teachers around the world and make sure your teaching stays fresh and relevant for students of all ages and stages both now and into the future? I created our Top Music Pro membership to be the one-stop shop for music teaching resources, training, support and community and I'd love for you to come and join us inside. With over 40 comprehensive training courses, hundreds of teaching demonstrations and lesson plans, free monthly sheet music, discounts, and all the business and pedagogy support you could ever need, Top Music Pro is the community you've been looking for. If you're ready to level up your learning from the podcast and join thousands of other teachers in our global network, head over to topmusicpro.com today.